Good evening and welcome to Generation Movies on this fine Monday as we get ready to celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States this week. My name is J.W. Farwell, and that's how that's how Houdini died, you know? Uh, <laughs> joined, as always, by Rich Trees of Film Buff Online doing the mess around tonight. How are you, Rich? How are things going? I'm I'm doing great. Um, started off the day with uh, news that my, my one niece... Uh, had her baby, little baby boy. So welcome to the world, Bryson. Um, your great Uncle Rich is going to uh, make you a movie buff. Um, <laughs> so that's, yes. I'm up to five, I think now, great nephews and nieces. So Jesus, you're <sighs> prolific. Like your family's uh, prolific. We, we are Catholics. Um, uh, is it. Fingers crossed, everybody procreate. Um <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, let's get to the, some of the comments. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm really digging you uh, live tw- two times a week. Are you really? <laughs> I, I I thank you, Joe. You're it, you're kind. It seems like a lot, Joe. Really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, congrats on the new edition, Joe. Also says. Um. Uh, so here's the thing: if you do like seeing me two times a week, which again sounds a little far fetched, I just think it's and Joe with a very healthy man crush on me. Although it's a good night for Man Crushers. It's a it's a healthy buddy comedy night. Um, yes. If you like seeing this show or anything on the Indie Escape Network, please subscribe and like our YouTube channel. You can find all our stuff there. Um, and that's, you know, the like and subscribe has nothing to do but five seconds of your time to just click. And then theoretically, you don't have to watch anything ever again. But you should. Uh, but you should. But you don't have to. We want... We want the subscribes first, and then you. We would like you to listen to the show. And the views, views um, also count. <laughs> views are nice. Um, or you can check out the Indie Escape Facebook page, uh, where we uh, again we do a lot of our stuff. Um, we're going live on Facebook tonight, so we're we're just happy to be here and happy to have a good time. Uh, it's Thanksgiving week. There's of course lots of buzzing and things because it's a holiday week, and movie theaters are busy and cracked and you know crazy. Um, well, any big stories for you this week? Anything to pop out? I mean, we're getting everybody's getting antsy about Superman. Like I, I think it's hilarious the, the sheer volume of Superman legacy stories we're going to get in the next year and a half until the movie comes out. Yeah, we're uh, we're kicking it off with a big one though. I think uh, Nicholas Holt is in talks. It's not official zeroing yet. Zeroing in, yes, yeah, zeroing in. Yeah, on, but he's uh, in talks to play Lex Luthor, which I think that's a great choice for Lex. Yeah. Because I also it's think interesting that, because Nicholas Holt was also in contention to play Clark Kent Superman. as well. Yeah. So, so I the two the, it's two sides of the same coin, right? Like the yeah. uh, the two sides mm-hmm. of the same coin argument. But also, Which I, think, I don't think they've ever really examined as closely as this suggests they may this time around. They've never so. been this age wise. They've never been this close. Yeah. In film, I mm-hmm. mean, we've never had a Lex this. 
this young. And I mean, maybe then they have, that allows them to go back and kind of do like some of the Smallville stuff that worked really well in the old Smallville show. Because like Lex and Superman being put together immediately in life and Lex just developing a natural hatred for him over over the course of eight seasons of that show worked. It was one of the rare things on that show that was above and beyond anything else Superman based, right? I mean, that's... yeah. So maybe it's an interesting thing having them the same age. Uh, maybe a little bit of competition for Lois. You know what I mean? Like... Because mm, usually, usually, you know, we've had Lex played by much older. Gene Hackman was much older than Christopher Reeve. And, you know, Spacey was much mm-hmm. older than Brandon Routh. And we didn't get Lex in any of the, the, the new DC, so. Well, we kind of <laughs> did, but. Not Nobody really. wants to talk about him. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, I don't even count um, him. Rich. Rich. Yeah, it, it, it does suggest an interesting new dynamic that we haven't really seen explored before. And that's, that's that I find exciting. Um, yeah, Lex Luthor, I mean, yeah. boy genius, is an interesting is an interesting concept. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's see what other comments we got. Hold on, uh, let's see. I need some. I need new pillows. <laughs> Everybody needs pillows, my friends. Oh, sure we're getting to that. More than two. Good evening, friends. Ken. we'll get into it. We'll get into it. I mean, Amen. I mean, the other big uh, the other big story. Like we have a bunch of movies that are out, but like the box office is down. But it's it's stabilizing what a, a traditional Thanksgiving box office should be. We got more movies opening tomorrow. Hunger Games had yeah. a big weekend. Um, Marvel collapsed epically, historically. Yeah, that, that kind of breaks my heart. I mean, everybody I know who's seen it has at least enjoyed it. You know, it says, oh, it was fine. Um, it's just, I think, you know, again, we go back to the usual. Um, is there... I don't want a- them to be right. I don't want the mean people to be right. Yeah. Like... Yeah, I, I, it, it's not, oh, it's girls in the lead. It's more of a case of there's not a strong storyline yet through phases four, five, and six. And also the pandemic, um, Bob Chapek, former Disney CEO, basically pushed Disney Plus so much that it got people to expect Disney Plus to have something really quick after the theatrical release. And so they'd rather spend their time waiting think- there's more something psychological years. about piling on something that's so popular. Eventually, you get to a point where the hipper thing is to say how much you hate something, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think we're we're definitely in that phase. Uh, Madam Web is mostly female. Also, will that fail? That's not going to fail because of female leads, Ken. That's going to fail because it's a non. Uh, it's just a an offshoot Marvel movie that's made by Sony. It's it has nothing to do why yeah, it's not, like it. Not done it's well not going to fail well. because of women. It's going to fail because it's a bad Sony movie. Is what it like? I don't want it to be a bad Sony movie. Um, no, would I like, we like it to be good, but it that, looks like it's going to be a mess. Be hmm? Yeah, I mean, I, would we like it to work? Sure, but is it going to work? Carnage and Venom and uh, Morbius. Like, it, it leads me to believe we're not. It's not going to work. But it, like yeah. the Marvels that, has a much another, better. Go ahead. I was gonna say that's another case where we don't know what what direction they're going in. They're just kind of it feels like they're throwing stuff against the wall, and we don't know they're, ultimately they're what this storyline is supposed to be in these Sony Spider Man adjacent films. They're just I'm doing it to keep this they're, they're movie just, that really just, kind of explains it. But if that's not, not what it is. I'm going to be the They're voice really of reason not. here. We're going to fight about something in a moment, but I'm going to be the voice of reason about <laughs> this. These movies don't exist to actually make sense. They exist to keep to keep Spider-Man under Sony control. To perpetuate like, the IP. To perpetuate the IP and to also, because of that clause that Sony has, that they have to make a Spider-Man movie <coughs> what, every year, right? Or something like... Uh, every three years, I believe it is. Yeah, but they're churning them out. We're gonna get Craven the Hunter too. It's like yeah. that looks that looks terrible too. Um, <clears throat> not sure what I just walked in on. Laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Little under the weather now. Hi all. Hi Raven. I had the game on. I just thought John Travolta was standing commercial, and it was amazing. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, Travolta doing 
Saturday Night Fever as Santa is something I can never understand. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the other thing that's happening, we got Napoleon opening tomorrow. We got Wish opening tomorrow. We got, so it's a lot of busy things going on. We got a very busy holiday, travel holiday coming up. And that leads us to one of the greatest buddy comedy road pictures in the history of film. And that's not that. Oh, sorry. That was a surprise. I'm sorry. Ruining stuff. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Uh, Steve Martin, John Candy, John Hughes. Although, if you watch the movie, like the poster of Steve Martin is the lead. But if you look at the movie, John Candy is the lead. I think it's just because it's alphabetical order in the movie. But uh, Planes, trains, and automobiles, 1987. It's 36 years old, Rich. And I think... You know, when we talk about production, like, it's a quick shoot, 87 days. Uh, a lot of things that, like, they shoot, a lot of everything is that's, you know, is condensed into one area in uh, upstate New York, right? So they get mm -hmm. everything they need out of those spaces. They do have uh, certain shoots in Wichita for, uh, like, in a, a hotel in Wichita and also uh, St. Louis uh, International Airport, which gives one of the greatest scenes and cursing scenes in, in the history of film. Um, and it, but the shocking thing, a couple of things, shocking thing is that John Hughes isn't going to, wasn't going to direct this movie. Uh, and then Steve Martin signed on and he's like, okay, I guess I have to direct it now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the script he gave to Steve Martin, and I was talking to you about this earlier, the script he gave to Steve Martin was 145 pages. Now, 145 pages uh, equals out to about a two hour and 25 minute movie. Usually scripts that are 120 pages are about two hours, figure two minutes a page, right? Or something along. Is that what it is? Two minutes a page? A minute um, a page. A minute a page. So 145 pages <laughs> would be two hours and 25 minutes. Two um, and a half and hours. There is a, there is a three hour and 45 minute version of this movie that apparently exists and Chris Columbus has seen. So, like, the movie, when it's released, is 92 minutes. Um, and it's short, sweet. I, I Can you give me an idea of what you're thinking with regards to reading that this movie had a 145-page script that was handed well, to Steve Martin? And Steve Martin's like, well, what's getting cut? What should I, well, what scene should I really about, focus on? <laughs> we've talked about ridiculously overwritten scripts before. Um, you know, when we're talking about Ghostbusters or anything Dan Aykroyd has ever typed. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have to wonder without, you know, I kind of poked around and I wasn't able to find a copy of the screenplay online. And I have to wonder how much of that was dialogue and how much of that was, um, just describing a comedic event like, um, bullet points of Steve Martin walking through uh, from the empty car rental stall back to the uh, to the airport, um, and how many other like little comic beats in there wound up. Well, they were cut. given free reign. One of the things that you read about in the production is they were given free reign to ad lib scenes. So like it was mm -hmm. written on one page one way, and if they got in there and started rolling, so that's why when he finished. The rough cut of the film was three hours and forty-five minutes. Like you, you I read that. I just think there's probably like alternate line readings, <laughs> alternate gags, and stuff like that, all pieced together, all punched together. Um, yeah. But I think that's fascinating. There's also one of the things that comes up about the screenplay is this weird, um, and you can see it in the movie still, but this weird concept that Neil Neil's wife believes he's cheating on her. Yeah. Right. So, so there's a whole like, and in one or two sequences in the movie, when he makes a phone call to her, she definitely has an air of uh, somebody who doesn't believe a goddamn word he's saying. And it's like to get there, I, you know, I, I'm glad it got cut because it's just one of those yeah, things it, where it, I. It looks like it's adding stakes to the, you know, it sounds like it's an idea to add stakes to the journey that they have to get home because. To, to prove his marriage that his, his wife, yeah, his marriage is in peril. 
But it's not really about that. It's really about just these two guys, how they relate and how they're, you know, how being thrown together for these 48, 72 hours um, changes them. And they realize, you know, how that affects their characters and all this external stuff doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. and Well, and that's the, the key. It's about two guys from different, different socioeconomic spheres that come mm-hmm. together in these mishap, just weird shit that happens to them. And if they become better people by the end of the movie. Now, I don't, I don't like glossy endings. I am a Spielberg fan, but I don't like Schmaltz that much. But this one, this is one of those movies where I, I tear up. I, I like it, the, the music hits and they're walking up the street. And I'm just, I lose my shit. Um, <laughs> and it's just, I can't control it. Also, it is, you know, production wise, it is one of the very few times where John Candy is not playing John Candy. So for me, John yeah. Candy is one of my all-time favorite actors. He, you know, I just, I love a funny chubby guy. I, it's just me. Um, and he is so goddamn good in this role. And it's like, the funny thing about it is it's ne- it never gets tapped again. He never gets another, except for maybe only the lonely, where it's a little bit like, he gets a little bit serial comic, right? Um, mm-hmm. It never really gets tapped again. Um, but so other other notices about the production that are kind of interesting. We'll get some comments in a moment. Um, like I said, I, I sheer volume of footage um, and the amount of things that were cut after the fact, but also that you know it was a crisp 80, uh, 85 days. It was. They yeah. got in, got out, <laughs> you know, and just the idea that they were able to shoot in places and just get it done and get it done correctly is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, now, what's interesting about this also, too, is, um, like you said, um, once Steve Martin came on board, Hughes found, found himself going from writer, producer to director on this. Um, and it's funny because if you look just a few months earlier, he was off filming um, She's Having a Baby with um, Kevin Bacon and I think it was Molly Ringwald. And that's how, that's how. No, yeah, Elizabeth McGovern. Or Liz McGovern, excuse me. And that's no how that's Kevin Bacon shows up in this because he's suddenly part of the um, the John Hughes um, Rep. repertory company of Yeah, players. the repertory company. Well, and, there, and, and in the movie is still going on. John Candy is also in She's Having a Baby doing a cameo as Chet, his character from, from the Great, the great Outdoors. Outdoors. So those two films, cinematic universe. Uh, <laughs> but well, it is it is the John Hughes cinematic seen, universe. You, know, you also get Edie McClure, um, the guy who played Ferris Bueller's dad is in this film here. Um, also, uh, Ed there's Rooney, like one or two Rooney, other people. Ed Rooney was cut. <laughs> <laughs> Not the character. Um, but the actor, Jeremy, uh, Jerry, oh, fudge. Oh, <laughs> my God. Name. What's the name? Oh. Um, oh, no. Good, good, oh, my gosh. Senility. This is take terrible. Me. We are terrible. What happened? Uh, Jeremy, Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey Jones. God damn it. I know. Um, okay. So getting old sucks. Uh, anyway. <laughs> but the interesting thing there is, like, so all these people are part of the rep. All these people are in the movie. Um, <laughs> um, and and the thing is, it's it jumps from it, it's it's the production is solid. Uh, let's talk. Let's get some comments. So, um, so something to do with Miles the Spider Man. Not fair. Not the same. <clears throat> no different no yeah but miles is animation yes that's the truth there we go not a steve martin fan interesting um like not a steve martin fan ever can like the jerk dead men don't wear plaid no never okay <laughs> This is the second Steve Martin film we've done too, I think. Yeah. We did that wear plaid. Um I'm trying to remember. I think these are the only two that we've done so far. 
At some yeah, point, I'd like to go right. back and do Bowfinger on here, but Bowfinger. Well, Bowfinger would be great. I also think the Jerk mm -hmm. warrants just because it has Carl Reiner in hey, it. Hey Ken, how do you feel about Martin Short? <laughs> because if you don't okay. like Martin Short either, you're probably not going to love it when we do um, Three Amigos. So <laughs> ever Chevy Chase either. Okay, okay, okay. That that will be your lifeline when we talk about um Love Marty. Okay, he likes Marty Sherman. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Ed Grimley's Ed, Ed Grimley's good. But but that's the thing. I think the interesting pairing here is you have Steve Martin who has you know very heavy SNL ties, you have John Candy with very heavy S SCTV ties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I'm listening. Also, cooking. Finally, feeling dinner. I know you're going through it, Raven. So, right, thank you for watching. We appreciate it. Um, so, production goes pretty quick. It gets released. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry about the coughing. And we get to box office now. <coughs> oh, Jesus Christ! Okay. I'll be okay. I promise. Um, okay. Well, this was you know shot for a fifteen million dollar budget, which isn't too bad for the time. Uh, fifteen million dollars. It it grosses uh forty nine. But when mm -hmm. when you look at the numbers, right, it has a seven million dollar opening weekend. If you look at for adjusted uh, domestic box office, it's one hundred thirty one million dollars. Imagine a comedy making one hundred thirty one million dollars right now. <laughs> <laughs> we can't get close to that shit. We can't um, get a comedy out into the theaters to talk about. Uh, that is to, very uh, true. Uh, yeah. But I, I also, with the box office, I wanted to look because one of the interesting things <laughs> that you read as I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Is that it came in third in its opening weekend, grossing seven million. Um, mm -hmm. but it stayed in the top ten for seven weeks. <laughs> so I did a quick deep dive just to get an idea of why did it open third and why did it open, you know, uh with only seven million. It turns out November uh November of the November twenties of nineteen eighty seven were incredibly competitive, Rich. Oh <laughs> what did we have coming out that month that weekend? Well, the first weekend, the first two days it's out, it's going up against the running man, fatal attraction, a Cinderella re release, the nineteen eighty seven release. Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and the beginning of the three men and a baby phenomenon. Oof. Yes. So the beginning of the three men and a baby opens. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. man. That is a mess of good film. Yes. I mean, um, Running Man, Fatal Attraction, Three Men and a Baby, and, and Cinderella re release. Um, the following week, by that point, uh, Plane, Trains, and Automobiles jumps to second in its second week of release, right? And everything mm -hmm. kind of starts falling down. But Three Men and a Baby becomes the highest grossing movie ever released by Buena Vista during that month, at the end of that month. So Plane, Trains, and Automobiles kind of up against it. Yeah, it, um, Three Men and a Baby was bananas. In turn, It was, like you said, it was a phenomenon. It was a juggernaut a, that kind of came through and everything else was running for second <coughs> yeah first week uh, of the three million baby gross three million second week it grows 13 million it goes up 270 percent in its <laughs> first weekend of release from its first weekend of release so it becomes like i was just curious as to why what happened to planes trains and automobiles um and Planes, Trains, and Automobiles did end up beating. It almost tied Cinderella. It came in second to Cinderella, um, but it beat Fatal Attraction and beat Running Man. But mm -hmm. again, that 
three men and a baby thing is just part of the reason that that movie couldn't take off in quite the way it should have. I, I view Rich is because Three Men and a Baby was taking all the all the Air adults. Like his Three Men and a Baby was what? That was a that was a very it was PG thirteen, right? Mm -hmm. But it was still it was so popular with you know people in that age range for planes, trains, and automobiles. I found that fascinating. And also the women thing going into it. Planes, trains, and automobiles is is decidedly not. I don't think it's fe it's not female adjacent, but it's not female <coughs> orientated. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, and I dare say, um, this movie could have been more financially successful if they had picked a, a different weekend, but. It's a Thanksgiving movie. <clears throat> it's about getting home for Thanksgiving. So what do you do? You don't move that to uh, February or anything like that. So it has its own clear runway. You know, yeah. it's just an unfortunate thing where, you know, the other studio put up, was it Universal, I think, did uh, Three Men and a Baby? No, Three Men and you a know, Baby was Buena Vista. It was Buena Vista. It's, one of, it's one of the first big touchstone movies. Yeah. Um, so you know, so Disney wasn't going to blink on that. Um, well, and, and maybe also, if brought that, this out a week earlier, it could have hit bigger, and then you know, run. But you know, whatever. It is what it is. Still, again, when you're looking at it, forty nine million on a fifteen million dollar budget, and the fact that it lasted about eight mm -hmm. weeks in theaters is pretty amazing. Um, so, I, I, it's it's such an odd little thing and the the other side of this with box office for this movie is that when you're looking at it when you're looking at everything involved the sheer volume of of releases digitally and releases like discs for this movie this is one of the home media channels like dvds oh yeah blu-rays this this movie gets released it's consistently part of any kind of paramount john hughes collection it it is it you know, one of it, it has a rare um, success of being one of the first things to be packaged as a bunch of digipack Paramount Picture Collection I Love 80s movies. Like, and it, it not only did the I Love 80s movies, John Hughes classic 80s movies, and all of these other things, it was packaged with Pretty in Pink, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, um, some kind of wonderful, and other movies. She's having a baby, mm -hmm. and things like that. So, it, it is. It is one of those movies where it is, it's it's been out a lot, and like it, you know, is one of the first movies to ever have be an exclusive Best Buy movie. Um, you know, first exclusive Best Buy release, and they yeah. just released um, in October. I, I remember, um, oh geez, it just slipped off my tongue. The um, Steven Soderbergh, uh, George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez. Oh, yeah. out of sight. Out of sight, yeah. That was a Best Buy exclusive for a while, too. Um, and then last year, to celebrate the 30th, 35th anniversary, they did a 4K UH, uh, UHD release um, that has 75 minutes of deleted footage, extended footage, that was found in the John Hughes archive. So, I mean, it is... It has made its money back several times over. Um, and I think that's one of the great stories about it is that it it's an enduring movie and it's enduring because it was found early and it just has never stopped being released. You know what I mean? It was what I was actually when I started changing everything over to digital to be able to just not worry about discs. I mean, I have discs, but I don't worry about them quite as much as I used to. It's one mm -hmm. of the first things that I changed over. to. So I, a couple comments. Let's see. <laughs> JW sounds sick. Yes. True. I, I can't really be sick because it's Thanksgiving week and we have a lot of people coming. Uh, Rick Moranis would have played Martin's part better. In, in this? I don't I don't know. That's um I love <laughs> Rick Moranis. 
and and I I think the um the physical disparity between him and John Candy is always especially hilarious. In the shot where they're carrying the the trunk and stuff would be hilarious. Um, but I just don't know that he has the the dick in him. Like there, the straight, I'll give you the sequence that Moranis would not be able to pull off that Martin is clearly destined to pull off. There's a sequence. That is so mean and so brutal where he's just talking about how, you know, stories should have points and how he's a chatty Kathy doll, except you're the only one pulling it. Right. <laughs> um, it's so brutal and so mean. And I just don't think Rick Moranis could pull that off. And and I love Rick Moranis. <laughs> and I love Kenny, his ass. Second City and SCTV and so much of what they've done together on that is just Freaking brilliant. Um, uh, I know if these people get sick, they'll better plenty of agua and vitamin C. I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Got a show to do. Uh, dying isn't an option. Thank you, Joe, as, as I'm thinking you exactly that. I remember my parents taking me the 80, 87 Cinderella release. So okay, I don't remember the movie. I, I just think remember the cover cut out standing in the for him. It's left out of weird memory. That's why we love movies. Um, <laughs> three minute baby had Tom so like it's hard with the ladies. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> also, had Ted Danson coming off of Cheers, and also Steve mm. Gutenberg coming off the Police Academy series. So <laughs> it really was a bigger phenomenon than you can imagine. Um, hmm, Select and his man rug. Laugh out loud. Uh, Selick and his man rug. Okay. Selick, laugh out loud. And then um, PTNA is a classic. I agree. Actually, I think he's right. Maybe they really should better really get word of mouth. <clears throat> you know, yeah, we know what you meant. I, got you. I think Ken meant Rick for three amigos. <laughs> nope. Oh. <laughs> There's my mistake. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, so we're, <laughs> we're on. Um. Okay, so box office is great. Um. I'm going to move things along only because I don't want to die during the show. Um, so, and, and I really love the movie. So the fact that I'm getting sick during this movie is terrible. A uh, quick response then and now. So a couple things. Um, I think <laughs> first off, this is widely regarded as the movie that allowed John Hughes to make an adult, other adult movie. Right. Um, and the resp the critical response Positive reviews from Siskel and Ebert. Positive reviews from a bunch of people. Ninety, and we use Rotten Tomatoes on the show. It's at ninety-two percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and the audience score with over a hundred thousand ratings is at eighty-seven uh, percent. That hmm. puts it in line with movies like Raising Arizona, Animal House. <coughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's. It's definitely something where it is a great movie, right? Where it's across the board. And the love the love affair of the movie is that it mixes heart and comedy so deftly. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's I mean John Hughes has been doing this before with um with his teen movies. You know, you look at something like 16 candles and you know that speaks to you know it has its problems yes we know but um i think it does speak to the teenage experience and um as does uh breakfast club <clears throat> here he's kind of just taking that empathetic uh care that he has about characters that he creates <clears throat> and transferring it to here and it it works really well, and I think you know because they're they're you know adults, they have uh, more lived experiences. He can dig a little deeper into them, and you get something like okay, the um, the reveal about uh, John Candy's wife having about passed now. eight years before. Um, I think kind of was a little obvious, you know, when he you know the second he said that, oh. I haven't been home in years and that uh, Steve Martin's character doesn't pick up on that um, when they're sitting in the diner. 
is is a little surprising. I think that's maybe a moment where the the movie is cheating just a little bit um, in order to have Steve Martin's character have that revelation later on. Um, and um, I, I agree with that. That, I think that, kind of, that kind of makes me feel like, oh, I'm smarter than the movie. I don't want to be smarter than the movie. I mean, I I'm a smart guy. I, I don't ever want I to be think, smarter than the movie. I, 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 I want to be different view. To I'm going to give you a different view. I've I rewatched it, you know, today, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me give you a different view. I think one yeah, of the it, interesting things that that does is, yeah, you can pick up on it, especially if you've seen the movie before. Um, and I think you can pick up on it pretty easily that Dell's, you know, says conflicting things down the way. But I think part of the interesting thing is Martin's character is never there to receive it early right martin's character you know until he he has that moment where he invites him in in the cold snowy like you're, you're gonna freeze to death out there and they have the drinking moment and all the different things mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know that neil is is i don't know that neil is ready to receive that at that at any other moment except when he's on the train heading home and guaranteed to be home you know what I mean? And then he starts piecing things together. So I'm willing to let it go. Now, is it great that we figure it out beforehand as an audience? Maybe not. But it doesn't change the fact, critically for me, that it is John Candy's abs. I know you're going to get a lot of people who say Uncle Buck or Great Outdoors or any number of John Candy movies, but this is the summer summer rental uh, all fantastic John Candy performances, but this performance, Del Griffiths. Uh, you know, we did a, a thing back, way back when on Loud Nerding. Somebody said, "What is the role you want to play?" This is the role I want to play. This role, it it, it can't be it, like I'd never I I'd want to play, it, but I wouldn't want to play. It. Um, mm -hmm. but it's such a well. It's he's such a lovable doofus <laughs> that does push people away. that is irritating that is all of the things that Steve Martin character says but he's also nice enough not to say it to other people you know and he is like wearing this shield of like you know the guy that walks in and goes I'm still a million dollars short of being a millionaire you know like his his deliveries to people and talking to people and just it, it, for me it's infectious it it it, it Generate it, gar it, it galvanizes the movie against anything else <laughs> you could come up against it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you could say the situations are forced, or you could say, you know, the, the, the characterizations of middle America is ridiculous. Um, any number of things, but the comedy moments hit so hard that, um, you know, when the heartfelt shit happens, it just, it, it, works so well like comedy moments like this hold on i have pictures is there a greater <laughs> comedy moment than this those aren't pillows <laughs> is there a greater comedy moment than like and here's the thing if we're looking I'm at just... it critically then and now do they get up a little bit like shaken about you know the idea they may have touched each other in a, in a homosexual way it's, maybe it's a little gay panicky but I th I think ultimately though it's <clears throat> it it's not a mean spirited. Game no, game it's game. it's not. It's like I think we did. What about the football game? Now, odd thing, if they are talking about November twenty second, nineteen eighty seven, when the movie takes place, <laughs> the Bears did win that football game against the Detroit Lions that win that Sunday, and they did play well. They won thirty at ten. Odd trivia <laughs> fact. Um. Uh. Also. You were talking a little considering bit about, they filmed this year uh months before that game was actually played yeah amazing uh we also talked a little bit about kevin bacon mm -hmm. uh creating the john hughes universe <laughs> which is just crazy because Sherman illinois is always a mention um mm -hmm. and, like, and a little it's a great i was gonna say it's a great moment from bacon too because he doesn't have a single line of dialogue it's all it's all physical and it's a yeah race on opposite ends of the street it's one of the greatest it's mm -hmm. one of the greatest things that like with obstacles on the new york street that you would expect from anywhere else <laughs> <laughs> um 
So it, also, I, I do want to point out that, you know, this sequence, everybody says, you know, it's a pretty clean movie. Why is it R-rated? This sequence that you see on your screen right here, Eden McClurg, Steve Martin, uh, 19 F-bombs in a matter of 45 seconds. Um, Somewhere a young Quentin Tarantino took note. <laughs> I think it's the greatest cursing moment in the history of film. I mean, there are great cursing moments, right? Uh -huh. um, you know, I've, there are great cursing moments, but this four fucking wheels and 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 a seat is, you know, it's just it's amazing. Um, that is another thing. The script is so deft at at weaving in jokes. Um, my fa my Even favorite joke. My favorite joke in the movie is Steve Martin punches him, uh, punches John Candy in the stomach, and John Candy gets in the car and he says, um, "You shouldn't hit people like that. You shouldn't hit me like that. That that hurt. That's how you Houdini died, you know." And I'm just like, it's such a weird throwaway line. Mm -hmm. That's entirely <laughs> true. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> there was. Something funny I noticed this time around. Um, <clears throat> at, at, at the last hotel stay, after they with the burned up car, they back into the hotel and then they hop in the, you know, Steve Martin hops in and they zip out of the parking lot. They zip up to the edge of the parking lot to turn right onto the street. Blinkers and left. Their bl left blinkers blinking. It's, it was yeah, the first it, time I caught that. It just like totally made me guffaw. Well, and and Ke uh, there's a scene with Michael McKeon who comes up and goes, "Do you think this car is safe for interstate travel?" Yes, yes, I do. Do you have? So let me. I want to make sure I understand. You have no mirrors. No. You have <coughs> no working, no working instruments. No, we don't. But the radio works. So who would have thunk it? It's coming in crystal clear as a bell. It, it, <laughs> there's just something. Like about the movie that's infectious. <laughs> it's funny. There's, I mean, there are so many quotes, the quotable lines from the movie. There's also sequences that people like from a comedic standpoint, you have to love. Um, mm -hmm. they go to the Braidwood Inn, which is the hotel. It's it's John Candy's friend Gus Dell's good friend Gus. We sells he sells everybody shower curtain rings. That's what he sells. Um. It says Gus's son is going to take us to the train. Gus shows up. It's Dylan Baker. It's a young Dylan Baker. Yeah. Uh, you know, was, of course, it was in Trick or Treat and Happiness and <laughs> so many great movies and, and just, you know, disclosure. Uh, all these Sam Raimi Spider Man films. Yes, yeah, Sam Raimi Spider Man films. As with Dr. Connors. Kirk, as Kirk Connors. Mm -hmm. um, but he plays the hillbilly. <laughs> whose wife he orders to carry the trunk don't worry she may look skinny but but she's she's strong mm -hmm. two kids one of them came out sideways it, it's just it's it's so good and he has a moment where he's like like where he's doing something with his nostrils like it, it's just it, everything clicks <laughs> um some of the classic reviews uh I think, you know, when you think about it, like, the reviews weren't perfect, but they were good. Like, the Siskel and Ebert, Ebert says, it's perfectly cast and soundly constructed, and it also flows naturally. Steve Martin and John Candy don't play characters, they embody themselves. That's why the comedy, which begins purely planted in the, in the twin genres of road movie and buddy pictures, is able to, to reveal so much heart and truth. Mm. <laughs> if you can get heart and truth out of your buddy comedy, that's a win. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, a road movie is a great vehicle, no pun intended, <laughs> to just take two funny people and move them from situation to situation to situation uh, with the you know, big goal of getting somewhere. Um, it's it's worked with you know Hope and Crosby for a number of times. It works here. It works um, kind of the formula for blues brothers even uh but there's some you know slightly different variations there and it, when you it, have 
few people who are as you know comic geniuses in their own way comedically gifted uh, is the word yeah and the way you know at first you know you're like well i've seen john candy stuff it's kind of big and broad on sctv like the johnny larue character uh stuff like that or his version Go of or, Bells, or um Go dr tongue's uh house of 3d pancakes uh and stuff like that it you know it's like very broad and silly and then suddenly we have this and it's it's such an amazingly heartfelt performance you know i mean i'd have to go back and look at what else was going on in the year but man i hope people were at least considering him for you know like a best supporting actor i i think here. i think he's one of the unjust the unjust geniuses in film history like i think we look we'll look back at some like we're looking back tonight but we will look back at some like <laughs> at john candy on a whole mm -hmm. and just realize that he he delivered way way more than like i know there are people out there that love chris farley or people that love belushi belushi of course is an icon but john candy delivered consistently he was often paired up with the absolute you know yeah. highest I, rated people like steve martin dan Aykroyd, marino hera you know what i mean like you you think about the people yeah. he's paired up with and he I, had I to think play off belushi, i don't i think belushi at least had a chance to show some of his dramatic chops <laughs> in like continental divide great um, movie i was just gonna say that it's a fantastic a, movie. sub and kind of subdued you know, also a chicago film um and also kind of subdued in neighbors where they let you know danny run rampant like you know like a crazy person there oh, um movie. Chris oh Farley, i don't think ever got the chance unfortunately he, yeah you know he i don't know if it was a case where he was unsure about pushing to a more dramatic space or he was working towards it internally for himself before he tragically died um but you know, I think if, you know, we go with the, you know, uh, okay, a friend of mine who uh, I met when I interviewed him as part of a regional um, improv and sketch comedy group, uh, he introduced himself as basically, I'm the fat, funny guy. Every comedy group needs a fat, funny guy, except for Monty Python. But if you look at Saturday oh Night Live, you look at the one guy who's, you know, heavy set and, you know, I had no idea other people did that, but I—that's how I was introduced when yeah. I was part of Chris, Chris Chris Barnes Comedy Dojo. There were okay. two groups of people. I was one of the fat funny guys. Yeah, and you know, looking at famous fat funny guys. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, John Candy probably had the best. Uh, of those three guys he had the best career because he was able to um and i wonder too if it's partly because of his um second city training although um belushi had that and i think um uh chris farley did too you know of creating a character and letting the comedy come out of that and i think that helps uh john candy at least tap into some of the more emotion uh the more emotional beats for this and also, by all accounts, John Candy was just a really nice guy. Uh, Belushi was kind of volatile, um, but well, you, look, you know, you look at you, you look at Candy. Wait, and keep, this and is an interesting thing. Kind of empathetic. You look at Candy, right? Candy, listen to this career starting in eight. Well, he's in, in a lot of stuff, but he's in Blues Brothers. He's in Stripes, right? Nineteen forty-one, right? He's in mm -hmm. those. He's in heavy metal. He's got National Lampoon's Vacation, plays the, the, the guard. Uh, going Berserk, Splash. He's fantastic as Freddie Bauer in Splash. Brewster's Millions. Summer Rental, Volunteers, Armed and Dangerous. Little Shop of Horrors. Spaceballs. Uh -huh. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles in 87. She's Having a Baby, The Great Outdoors. Hot to Trot. Who's Harry Crumb? Who's Harry Crumb, by the way? terrible movie but it's so fucking good um it, it's <laughs> one of the worst funniest movies i've ever seen in my life him dressed as a jockey is one of the greatest things ever uh speed zone uncle buck uh let's see 
home alone he's in home alone nothing mm-hmm. but trouble oh my god that's so bad but again he's good in it uh only mm-hmm. the lonely he's in jfk uh, he's in once upon a crime he's in rookie of the year he's in cool runnings how by the way is there a mo- there's a moment in plants uh, and this is a perfect time to jump to this Mm. Legacy franchise, right? There's a moment in in Plane, Trains, and Automobiles where he's drinking Jamaica rum, man. Oh, I'm going to Jamaica, man. And all I could think, like, I'm like, how ridiculous is that? One of his great, uh, one of his other greatest roles that tr- that straddles comedy <clears throat> and kind of comedy and kind of seriousness is Cool Runnings, right? Where he plays the he plays the coach of the Jamaican bobsled team. Um, so I mean. He has a fantastic, uh, and I, I do kind of want to say, you know, his his moment in um in Home Alone, where he's working again with his SCT colleague uh, Catherine O'Hara, um, and he gets to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah, but they're, they're at Scranton International Airport, which is really Evoca people, but um, Evoca. He, he's he's sweet and he's empathetic. And he's he's not playing comic. He's playing a character. And even for so so even for something small like that, or like a JFK and some of the other stuff, you know, he's really ah, we really fucking lost out on this. Yeah, <laughs> we did, and we and that's even his last two wag, wagons east and Canadian bacon are strangely, they're tragic movies, but they're strangely like ambitious movies. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, Wagons East and Canadian Bacon are Wait. really ambitious. Like they're not, yeah. they're not junky comedies. They're like asking serious oh. questions about like, what does it mean to be America's neighbor to the north? You know what I mean? Like especially when America's yeah. going crazy, doing stupid shit. Can't imagine mm-hmm. what he'd be thinking now. Um, but yeah. also, you know, the um, the huge. I was going to say, and 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 Canadian Bacon should also be pointed out that that was. Um, um michael moore's only fiction film outside of his documentaries um you know and it's it's very satirical it's very interesting but and he he also at the end he does dedicate the film to john candy this is his john candy's last released film and the de- the dedication and i will always remember this um because it's it was a callback to um some of his sctv stuff and when I saw this movie in the theater with my friend, I almost cried because I thought it was so beautiful, a beautiful summation. You know, um, you know, this film is dedicated to John Candy. Um, we got the crane shot, Mr. LaRue, which is a callback on SCTV. His actor, filmmaker, character of Johnny LaRue always wanted a crane shot, but it was always too expensive to do. And so, you know, f- to say we finally got that crane shot for you, it, yeah, I think, it, it touched me in a way that I was I just like, Tom, as I a fan, loss, as a longtime fan, I was just like, oh. I think man. for years we thought about the loss of John Belushi as the ultimate loss of a comedic genius. But when you really piece together everything that John Candy was able to accomplish in a short amount of time, you know what I mean? Like basically mm-hmm. 10 years on film. The sheer volume of work he did with and the people he worked with, right? Um, I, I think his his legacy is kind of something that we this movie entrenches it. This movie is the ultimate, you know, I can do both. I can be an actor and I can be a comedian, and I can be a comedic actor that delivers dramatic role, that delivers dramatic stuff. I was talking about this. I I think it's in like for me, it's in my top ten comedies of all time. Like it's, it's very, it, it's very much in the in the running for bottom five of my top ten. So I mean, um, that's not a that's not an insult. Um, let's see other comments. Let's see, we've been missing some. Um, let's see, dying is not an option. Working on it, Joe. <laughs> trying to get through the episode. Uh, Canadian bacon is funny. Rest in peace, John Candy. Um, mm-hmm. Let's do Blues Brothers. Maybe. Blues, yeah, sorry, I'm sure at some point we're going to do musicals. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving Honorable Turkey the Award of the funniest episode of WKF Prince Turkey's Away episode. 
Yes, Les Nessman saying I had under I had never knew that turkeys couldn't fly. Um, okay, um, first of all, as a big KRP fan, I'm going to correct you on that. Yeah, it okay. was it was the big guy, Mr. Carlson, who said, "With as God is my God witness." Is my I witness. Okay, I'm sorry. And secondly, I love that this time of year everybody remembers WKRP existed. It's one of my favorite shows uh, from that time period. Uh, it's insightfully funny. And it just got funnier and funnier, uh, you know, in the year, my years after college, when I worked part-time at a radio station, it just made up, it it was was like, oh my God, yes. And um, I do wish other, I do wish people would remember some of the other great episodes of that series, including uh, the episode where they do the, um, the commercial for the funeral home uh, for ferryman's and it's got a zippy upbeat jingle. It's hilarious. And even, you know, it would get more thoughtful at times. You know, it took place in Cincinnati. It was a rock and roll station on the, and the show was on the air um, at the time of that tragedy uh, at the Who concert in Cincinnati in um, 79, when uh, because of festival seating, they had some uh, gates that were locked, but people were pressing up against them. And um, I can't remember the exact number, but several people lost their lives in the stampede to get to the front of the venue to, you know, get really great seats. And um, <laughs> so they, they do an episode dealing with that and how the station, you know, personnel felt about that, how they were in shock uh, about that. There was another episode where we find out uh, Venus Flytrap actually went uh, MIA when he was a soldier in Vietnam. And, you know, you have to deal with, you know, for basically a silly comedy they kind of got into a whole idea about you know the the morality of war in general the morality of the vietnam war in uh particular um the older generation it was definitely it was definitely ahead of its time as a show it was definitely ahead of its time it's one of those shows oh yeah there's so many great stuff and i wish it was streaming somewhere but again music rights are a real bitch on this show so it's it's hard Um, to see now outside of youtube so go Other find it comments, on YouTube and watch see. more episodes than just this one is all that I'm uh, saying. Yeah, I'd get, I, I don't know much than that. Then we got Raven said, guys get to be funny fat guy, girls get to be bitchy fat girl. I don't know about that. They're, nah. I don't know. Um, but I think the other legacy, um, he really was a man. Um, I think the other legacy that we have to talk about is this is one of the roles where Steve Martin plays an adult. Um, and so part of like part of um, that change that Martin goes through from the 80s to the 90s, where he starts making movies, the legacy of this movie is that he is he's the straight man in this movie. He, he he's mm-hmm. not he's a comedic foil, right? And if you look at the legacy of this movie, this is the this is the movie where he actually gets to. <laughs> <clears throat> prove his chops um foil wise but also it's the portion where he actually starts coming forward and basically um it, it, you know it, the movies that come after it right when you're looking at the steve martin filmography the movies that come after this movie um are dirty rotten scoundrels parenthood my blue heaven la story father of the bride Mm-hmm. Grand Canyon, House Sitter, Leap of Faith, Simple Twist of Fate, Mixed Nuts. The, so, a Spanish Prisoner. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, the you legacy of doing, the- doing something like Parenthood or Father of the Bride without this movie. <clears throat> well, At and all. yeah, yeah, and it, it's something where he wasn't doing that in the 80s, and then this movie hits and it becomes, it brings out the legacy of this movie. Is that it's it, it, he gets to become an adult, right? With actual like fo- like foibles and problems. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing we have to talk about is that they're thinking about remaking this movie. This is a mistake. Like, I know I say that every time they think about remaking a movie <laughs> that I really love, but this is a mistake. Uh, the mm-hmm. rumor people, and again, I. I of course, it's probably changed because of what's happened recently. But um, 
it was remake was set in motion around August of 2020. It was Will Smith and Kevin Hart. I have no I have no care in the world about who you're putting in the movie. You can put any type of person you want in the movie. They're going to have a real tough time living up to this particular movie. I also have a funny feeling, Rich, that you know if we <coughs> were to look at that particular screenplay, I'm wondering if they're going to do Thanksgiving. And it won't be, it'll be changed to some other, like a Christmas holiday. You know what I mean? Like, well, at, I, at some point, too, before this version, they were looking at what was it, Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore? Um, no, it was Sandler and, Bar- it was Sandler and Barrymore. Oh, okay. Which is Sandler. even weird. It, like Sandler and Barrymore, who have a bunch of really good movies together. But again, I would argue, like, interesting thing there. And I mean, clearly, who would be who in that regard, right? Uh, I, I don't think know. You make I, Sandler the the Steve Martin character and let Barry Moore be the be Lucy Goosey. Yeah, the yeah. Lucy Goosey crazy. Um, also, a, a quick shout out to the kid who steals their money. He is, of course, one of the kids from summer school that loves the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I want to bring it up because I love summer school as well. So, has to be done. Um, but the franchise viability of redoing this movie, I think, is a mistake. Although we're thirty six years detached. The other problem with redoing this movie is that this movie has grown a a holiday shine to it. <laughs> Over the next couple of days, you will see people who reference it, talk about pillows. You will see people who uh, talk about uh, gave birth to one of the children came out came out sideways. You'll see all of that. And I think it's it's the lasting impression that this movie is one of the great American comedies great buddy road movies it's just so good i was I, it was really funny my wife came in and every time i watch a movie i do tear i tear up at the end i i admit it i admit that i tear up at the end my wife's like are you crying i'm like she goes you've seen this movie so many times how do you how do you? i'm like i cry every fucking time i can't explain it i the mm. music starts <laughs> it's fair and and i think too um you know this time of year <laughs> be emotionally tough on people who've lost you know beloved family members um you know i've watched friends go through with it you know this is the first thanksgiving uh since my mom passed so um i mean i've kind of been preparing for this mentally a little bit uh, over actually over the last couple of years um because you know parkinson's I know you gives have. you i know you have that long goodbye and um so i can i the you know, I can see where this is a great film. You know, it's a funny film and everything. And then it just totally sticks the landing on um, the emotional beat right here. Um, and yeah, every I, time, and every I think time it works, away. you know, works so well. And no one should be embarrassed or, you know, or have to apologize. No, it's, for... it's one of those things that's like, you know, like sometimes you watch a movie over and over again and it, it just gets you every time. Like, I, yeah. there are and and one of the things you could do as a film fan is try not to be gotten by the movie that got you. So you're like, I'm prepared this time, I'm prepared. Then every time it go away, it starts playing. And you're like, fuck, mother, damn it, son of a bitch. <laughs> um, but hey, a couple comments. I, every time I watch the episode of Mash where Henry leaves, the second <laughs> radar, you know, comes into the OR at the end. I'm I'm done, and. I think maybe it's just, you know, <laughs> being, being more confident in my own emotions and everything. Um, you know, I, maybe I'm an easy crier now. I don't know, but um, I, I allow a movie to uh, emotionally affect me yes, rather than okay. resist that. So this is part of the WKRP situ- uh, situation. As Rich mm-hmm. mentioned, music rates are an issue with a lot of TV shows. I really want a good copy of the TV series Werewolf. Did it, it did have great music though. Can we find a VHS rip on YouTube? Yeah. Sorry, Rich. And then he, I'm Thank out. You. Happy, happy today, all. And then have, have a, a great, great evening. <laughs> okay, it's a good place to end. But not before we change things up a little bit. So Rich and I were discussing. We're eventually going to get to Alice's restaurant, but. Not something came up where a couple people asked me why we weren't doing something in particular. 
and they made sense. I'm not going to say this often, but they were right. Uh, so, <laughs> so next week, uh, instead of doing Alice's Restaurant, we're going to change up. We are going to do the 30th anniversary of Adam's Family Values. Raul Julia, Angelica Houston, Christopher Lloyd, Christina Ricci, Carol King. Uh, one of the great Thanksgiving uh, comedies. It's also one of the great Thanksgiving releases. It is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. And we are going to bump Alice's Restaurant in an effort to, to celebrate uh, the Adam Family movies that did very well in the 90s with Barry Sonnenfeld directing. Um, and so I think that's a real interesting place to go. I'm excited about going there. And we will, I, I promise at some point we'll get to Alice's restaurant. But it's, it's perfect. It's 30th anniversary. <laughs> I like to be in on things when they're, things are celebrating things. And somebody sent me a message like why we were doing something that was a little bit obscure as opposed to something that's a little bit timeless and kind of, you know, has developed so many different fans and as one of the greatest, uh, turkey dance sequences of all time so <laughs> um let's see uh joe the actor who played the wolf is dying he had a transplant last week that's terrible um you're killing me smalls i have a show card this weekend sorry about uh, that joe you know we don't do this often to you <laughs> we don't do it often joe i'm sorry <laughs> but it had to be done um we love you thank you for all the work you love do you, um, okay, so Adam Family Values. I know you had everything done in advance. I'm so sorry. I um, appreciate you. We love you. But we're doing Adam Family Values next week. Uh, Rich, where can people find you before I cough myself to death? Uh, all of my written work is at filmbuffonline.com, uh, including, I believe, I have it scheduled to go tomorrow live. Uh, my, my review of Maestro which is opening this weekend uh, as part of a big pile of uh, holiday films that are opening uh, nice. over the next several weeks. Um, you can also uh, hear my other podcast, the big picture podcast with my very good co-host and very best friend, Natasha Bogutsky. Um, if I get that finished edited tomorrow, uh, we'll have that out tomorrow in the evening, hopefully. Uh, where we look back at the 40th anniversary of Scarface, the great Brian De Palma film, which was a remake of the um, 1932 film, which was an adaptation of a 1930 book. And we kind of dig deep into um, some of the psychology of the time. We talk about uh, the 80s um, and the American dream and a lot of the satire uh, that kind of went by critics at the time who really just wanted to criticize the movie for its violence and profanity. It's a um, bit of the ultra violence. Say a yeah. little bit. Don't get high. Yeah, it, I mean, but, but Life it's, you know, we, we kind of dig into all of that and it was a great conversation. And I was, <laughs> I was like really, really happy with, uh, you know, how that came out. Um, so look for that soon. Um, I am on socials on blue sky and Twitter at film buff rich. And uh, over on Facebook, you can find the Film Buff Online uh, page where we have links to all our articles and to when the uh, podcast goes up, as well as um, separate posts just for uh, history uh, films, a lot of on this date, for example. Today is the anniversary of the release of Rocky. So um, when it opened in New York City. Um, so Amazing. that's all the stuff I have going. And I'm exhausted. Uh <laughs> I'm exhausted as well. I, I, I'm gonna go down and get just listening to them. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get. You know, drink a bottle of Robitussin after the show. Uh, you can find me on the Facebook and Instagram and J and Twitter and Blue Sky, JW the Movie Guy. You can find me every Monday night here with my good friend Rich Trees. You can find me on Tuesday nights at nine o'clock, provided I don't cough myself to death. Uh, doing loud and nerdy <laughs> on the India Escape Network tomorrow night uh, with Kyle and. Kyle Defina and Jerry Kimura. Uh, we have a good show planned for you tomorrow night as we as we careen towards the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, last few comments. We will let's see. Rich is killing it. So cool. <laughs> yeah, Rich is Rich is killing it. Um, I'm killing you. JW's okay too. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Joe. 
<laughs> uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great night. I, I hope uh, from everybody at Generation Movie, we wish you a happy Thanksgiving. If you watch Hot yes. tomorrow, you get the same thing. But happy Thanksgiving from us. Have a great night. Stay safe. Oh, one last thing. Um, if you're a Mystery <laughs> Science 3000 fan, don't forget Turkey Day is coming up uh, starting at 9 a.m. on Thursday and runs through um, into Friday and I think into Saturday. I think they're doing like a solid 48 hours this year uh, as part of the uh, end of their fundraising drive. I'm saying this because um, on last week's episode of my podcast, I did an interview with Matt McGinnis of Mystery Science Theater 3000. He's a writer producer there. He's also a great guy. I've known him for years um, through some other things. So check that out. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Money. Stay out of trouble. We love you all. Thank you for paying attention. Subscribe and like. Take care, folks. See everybody next next week for Adam.